You're listening to sermons from La Cunada Congregational Church and Pastor Kyle Sears. Join us in person every Sunday at 10 a.m. in La Cunada for worship. You can find more information about our church online at lacanadachurch.org. Okay, so I'm not much of a sports guy, but it is Super Bowl Sunday, so I figured I should indulge everybody and uh, maybe talk about the most compelling part of the NFL this season. Um, this past week, Taylor Swift announced a new album. Did y'all hear about that? Um, my, my kids are super <laughs> excited about it. Um, but, you know, when her last album came out, um, my, my daughters had a little listening party, you know, right when it came out, and the music was different. You know, this weird kind of synth thing was happening. There was a lyric that says, karma is a cat in my lap. Um, I could tell that they weren't really liking the new album compared to the stuff from the old album. Now, as we continue to listen to it, the second and third time in the course of, what, three hours, uh, it began to kind of become a little more familiar and the kids begin to appreciate it and now we sing or maybe I sing a lot of it, uh, surprisingly, in the morning whenever I wake up. Um, But you know, there's, there's times when we just want to hear the hits. We just want the familiar music to be played, the familiar stories to be told. We want to be comfortable. We don't want to be challenged with what we like changing. Sometimes we're not ready for new songs to be sung. Uh, we're going to f- hear this morning how Jesus' followers react to both the familiar and the frustrating as he begins to reveal his divine plan of who he is and who he is calling them to be. And so this is Mark chapter 8, uh, verse 27 through Mark 9, verse 8. So Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered to him, John the Baptist, other people think Elijah, some others think one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, you're the Messiah. And then he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all of this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at the disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You're setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He calls the crowd and the disciples and says to them, if any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what could you give in return for your life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. And so six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling bright such as no one on earth could brighten them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. And then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let's set up three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He didn't know what to say because they were all terrified. And then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud came a voice, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. And suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. So Jesus starts by sharing what sounds like an incompatible message with his disciples, that the end of this road with me is going to be my death and then a resurrection. And both concepts were hard for them to imagine as they hoped for this Messiah because death was the end of tyrants. Death was the end of the upstart Messiahs who were just there to build a crowd around them but not really change the world. Death was God's ultimate judgment against people. So how could God judge Jesus, the one who is this true Messiah that we've confessed? 
And at the same time, how could he speak of resurrection when we all know that resurrection isn't what happens to one person, but the Jewish teaching is that resurrection waits for us in this far-flung future where everyone will be lifted up, not just one. And so Jesus, I don't know what it is that you're teaching, but what it is is not right. It can't be. The disciples were happy to look back on their history, finding contemporary leaders who embodied the ancient traditions of yesterday. We need someone like Moses, they would think. Someone who would stand up against the world powers, not afraid to speak truth to the most powerful person in the world, who would then faithfully lead God's people from through the desert, who could teach with authority, whose face would shine with God's glory on God's holy mountain. We need someone like Elijah, someone who would challenge the idolatry of the foreign gods, who could call fire down from the mountain, who could envision for us the redemption and restoration of God's people in God's land, where God restores the fortunes of those who have been the most marginalized and outcasts. In our passage this morning, beyond the mention of Moses and Elijah, we hear the allusions to their work of shining faces upon the mountains, of how God's glory is overflowing the mountains and pouring forth so that all might see it. And Mark's first readers as a Jewish audience would find comfort in Moses and Elijah and all that they come to represent. We kind of see similar appeals in, in, in movies. Um, you know, you'll see the advertisements that say, you know, from the director of, and you're like, well, I like that one, so I'll probably like this one, from the writers of. And it's a way to sort of say, well, in the same tradition as Moses and Elijah, now comes Jesus but he's not playing all the hits. (laughs) It's not the stories that we're most familiar with that he's talking about. There's a lot that happens here that is new and is hard to comprehend. First, Jesus is glowing, and that's kind of not something we see every day, or at least his clothes are, are glowing. And for people who are also not only Jewish, but then also exposed to the Greek culture, what they find is something that is familiar, of how humans who have been touched by the divine, have been empowered to fight otherworldly beasts and be a champion for the people, people like Heracles, those celebrated as demigods, both divine and human. This voice from heaven that speaks in this passage bestows the honorific of, this is my son, not unlike Caesar in Rome claimed to be the son of God. We've heard these words before too in the opening of Mark's story as well as at the baptism of Jesus where the son of God is given as a title to who Jesus is, not only to describe his relationship with God the Father, but also to describe his true kingship of this world. And so within this story, we have this coming together of all these various streams of reality that the people experienced. The Jewish longing for leaders who would restore the nation. The Greek heroes who could save the people. And the Roman rulers who could reign throughout the world. And these disparate parts now come together uh, like Voltron, maybe, um, where there's something more to it. That is a very specific uh, reference. Um, (laughs) Sorry, guys. Um, But you know, for someone to make claims like this in the way that Jesus does is ridiculous. And Peter knows it. It's says, like, hey, Jesus, um, this kind of talk isn't really winning over the crowd. So maybe you can like not say that part. But then we find ourselves on this mountain secluded with only a few watching what will happen where Jesus is now fulfilling the words where he said, some of you who hear this message will not taste death until you see the true power of God's kingdom in front of you. And most of the time when you hear this passage preached, the focus of the transfiguration is proof that Jesus was divine, a little peeling back of the layers to say, see, Jesus is pretty powerful. Don't you believe that he was God now? And I don't reject that idea, but that that part of the story is far too simplistic to only pull that message from it. Because if that's all that we were supposed to know, Jesus is God, then that doesn't really explain 
the disciples' response. Mark would have made sure to let us know that the disciples suddenly got it. But they don't. They're confused and terrified. A burning bush was more convincing than a person they could see and speak to, that they knew. And part of this, I think, is because there's this confusion that the divine is not supposed to suffer. So how is it that we see the glory of God in front of us, shining like daytime through his clothes, and yet he had just told us he's going to Jerusalem to die, to be handed over to those in power. Healing and glory and teaching and all that good stuff, yeah, that's what God is about, but the God who is gonna suffer, what I'm seeing with my eyes doesn't connect with what I'm hearing. And so Peter suggests that maybe we need to camp, camp out here for a little bit, Jesus, Maybe Moses and Elijah could stick around and teach you what it means to be a good leader because you're not really following the way that God would want you to be. Maybe they could set you straight on what your plans are. Now what we find, Mark says, is that Peter was so terrified and confused, he was just like spitballing ideas, like, you know, guessing at Pictionary, like, oh, you can be more like Moses, maybe it's Elijah. This one who had just confessed that you are the Messiah can't reconcile what the Messiah is meant to be. And as he's doing his best to guess how he could correct Jesus's past, suddenly Jesus is alone with them, a voice speaking and saying, this is the only one you need to hear. As much as we don't like to hear it, restoration is bound together with suffering. It troubles us to learn that God will suffer, that God experiences pain, because that might mean that God is weak. The cross sounds like foolishness. How could embracing our own suffering, our own death, marginalization and rejection do anything but bring us shame? How is it that leaders in the church from from very early on begin to teach that the cross is not weakness but power? Because the people saw how crosses would line their paths to the city to remind people that if you challenge power, this is your end. And yet now that entire story is being turned around. And so the disciples come down the mountain confused still. Scratching their heads, what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to suffer? What does it mean to rise from the dead? Surely it doesn't mean rise from the dead. If our passage is about anything, I think it's about expectations, that we hope so much for our life to be easy, for everything to work out for us, that we try hard, and because we've tried hard, that we get what we tried for. That the Christian thing to do would be to avoid risk and setback and frustration. And that even as we see injustice around us, we still imagine that good leaders taking charge and doing what's right will lead us to a good future. And yet, there's part of us that realizes that's not how it's working out. That this music that we're hearing is not what we want to listen to. We often fail to imagine how we'll be asked to choose what is difficult, to accept the parts of life we can't control, to encounter death and pain and do so without becoming cynical and angry. And so I get it. I'd rather just sit on top of the hill, camp out and listen to the songs that are the old familiar, just reminisce about the good days instead of having to go down into the valley and live in reality. Anything to avoid the hurt that lies out in front of us. Specifically there in Jerusalem where Jesus is going and will ask us to follow. But he reminds them that whoever wants to save their life, whoever wants to preserve their comfort, their privilege, and their power will lose it in the end. But whoever gives all that away freely Imagining as if there's infinite stores 
they end up discovering it. The call that we find is that we would take up our own cross. And so my hope is that we would be a people who would change the story that our suffering, our shame, our rejection, and our generosity are but empty signifiers. And instead we tell how a life that is given away, that follows Jesus, that knows our own suffering and the suffering of others, is the only life worth living. May we be a people who commit to knowing that the love of God eclipses life and death, hope and despair, that it alone becomes the center of all we come to know. Amen. Amen.